Very good evening. Good to have you with us tonight at Milton Baptist Church. We're very glad to have you along this evening. And we trust the Lord to bless you uh, for being with us this evening. Just to remind you that we will be meeting again this coming Wednesday at um, half past seven, where we'll be in the book of Isaiah in our Bible study, Isaiah chapter 44. And then again, we will be meeting uh, online next Sunday for the last Sunday of this present lockdown, uh, we trust, and resuming in-person services on Sunday the 6th of August at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. in the morning and 6 p.m. in the evening. You'd be very welcome to come along and be part of our service. We'd be very glad to see you, and I can assure you you'll receive a very warm welcome here at Milton Baptist Church. Well, our reading tonight, if you have your Bible <coughs> by you, is in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, which says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth, or out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening to again spend some time in your word. Help us tonight to receive your word as it is the very word of truth. Lord, to open its pages, not as any other book or any other document, but as the very, uh, the very breath of God, the life-giving breath of God. And Father, we pray tonight that we would recognize in your word that which is inerrant and infallible, that which is eternal and immutable, that which is inspired of thee. And Lord, we might take it to heart and learn from it and grow as a consequence of it. Use this time for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so far in the Gospel of Mark, we have been introduced to the ministry of John and the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of this was preparatory to the beginning of his earthly ministry. Now there is yet one more stage of preparation in that he must now be tested. He must be tried. He must be proven to be the very Son of God. You see, having established his legal claim to the throne of Israel in chapter 1, as we read the genealogy of Joseph uh, leading up to the Lord Jesus as his stepson and inheritor of the legal rights to the throne, we now are, are led to understand his moral right to the throne, that Jesus has a moral claim to the throne of Israel. You know, I was watching the BBC's technology show Click one morning, and when they were covering a story from the, uh, the consumer electronics show in Las Vegas, and at that show there was an exhibitor, a company that unveiled a, 
an unbreakable mobile phone. And uh, when asked what the phone was capable of withstanding, the director of the company who was being interviewed said that you could drop it from a 10-story height and it wouldn't break, that you could immerse it in over 20 feet of water for up to 30 minutes, and you could even hammer it with a nail and it would still prove indestructible. In fact, so confident was he that if you could break this phone in any way, the company would immediately and freely replace it with another. So the reporter put those claims to the test, as you would expect him to. First of all, he dunked the mobile phone into a tank of water. Then he rang the number, and sure enough, the phone under the water began to vibrate. He put his hand in, he lifted the phone out, and the phone was fully operational. He then took the phone and he hammered it four times, quite gently actually, on the corner of that tank of water, and to everyone's surprise, I should imagine, the thing broke, the screen shattered. Isn't that how men are in relation to temptation? We break so easily. We fail so readily. We're so frail. We prove ourselves to be weak. But here we read of God's man, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants you and I to know that he is who heaven claims him to be, the very Son of God, the perfect Son of God. And so he is led out deliberately leap into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil that we might see him as being absolutely unbreakable. The theological term is that he is impeccable, that Jesus could not sin. And yet his temptation was as real to him as any that you've ever experienced or I have ever experienced in this life. Now notice the occasion of it, as we read here in verse 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now don't miss the first word. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When? Well, the temptation of the Lord happened immediately after his baptism. It happened immediately after he had committed himself to fulfilling all righteousness, after he had identified with those who he had come to save, symbolizing his own death by the baptismal waters and committing himself, <coughs> excuse me, to his father's plan. Now, this is a detail that actually is replicated in each of the, uh, the Gospels uh, that record the life of the Savior. Each Gospel writer conveys the same truth, that it was after the baptism of Jesus that he was led out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the point is important because it's often after blessing that we enter into battles, and no amount of spiritual privilege may shelter you from that reality or from the ferocity of the trial or the temptation that you're going to face. This is a mistake that many believers make. We think because we've won some battle or other, we've won some victory here or victory there, we've enjoyed some wonderful time with the Lord, some mountaintop experience that we are home and we are dry. But the opposite is often the case. And we see this over and over and over again in Scripture. And yet what? Some poor fellow, even today perhaps, is standing for right, and he thinks the battle's won when suddenly he's going to find himself under the cosh. He's in the spotlight of, of, Satan's, uh, of Satan's temptation, and he finds himself facing a trial that puts his very testimony as a believer on the line. Or perhaps some new convert, eager to follow his Savior and to surrender, as his master did, to the practice of baptism. He, he goes and he, is, and he submits to that. He is baptized before a very happy crowd of people at the church. And there's a moment of victorious testimony. And he's reveling in the church's warmth and great approval of, of him and of what he's doing and extending to him the right hand of fellowship. But then within days or within weeks, or within a month or two, we find the same Christian struggling. And maybe we begin to wonder, even if they were Christians at all. You see, they've let down their guard. 
And in so doing, they've opened themselves up to spiritual attack. And the experience of Jesus teaches us just that. He steps out of the baptismal waters. He walks away from the Jordan Valley with the blessing of God ringing in his ears as his father spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what? He is tested and he is tried. Isn't that often the way? Well, the moment you please God, the moment you have victory, the moment you surrender to his will, what? You find Find yourself under temptation. There's the occasion of it. But now we see the location of it. Notice this. Again, that very first verse. Then was Jesus laid up of the Spirit into the wilderness. You know, sometimes the Lord brings us to a wilderness to a place of isolation, to a barren land, to a dry place where we are largely left to our own devices. We are left without the back, uh, the, 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 the support of, of the church, or, or we're, we're left without the backup of other Christians. And, and so we're brought there that we might learn not to lean upon others, but only to lean upon him. You know, if you and I were charged with leading someone into a place of temptation, I dare say that a wilderness would not be our first choice. We would probably want to bring someone, if we were going to tempt them, to some den of ice, to some place that is known for sin. Perhaps we might put them on an aircraft and fly them off to America and take them to the city of Las Vegas with its casinos and its gambling halls and its prostitution and, and so much more beside. And, you know, there is a place that is acknowledged the world over as a place that is, uh, is, is subject to open sin. Or maybe we might uh, take them into continental Europe and go to somewhere like Cannes or Marbella and let them observe the lifestyles of the rich and of the famous and hopefully tempt them to covetousness as they look at the material possessions of those people. And no doubt there were similar places in the time of Christ. But when Jesus was tempted, he wasn't tempted and led by the Spirit to some den of iniquity, but to the quiet isolation of a barren place. Why there? Because God knows us so well. He knows that temptations do not come from that which is without as such. Not from the casinos, not from the prostitution, the debauchery, not from alcohol or materialism. The problem is not an external problem. The problem is an internal problem. The problem doesn't come without. The problem is that we have a problem within. And, the, and what's true of us within is tested by that which is often without. The heart, we're told, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Can I suggest to you that in this year of lockdowns, there has been a real trial of heart for some people? That you've been put to the test. Perhaps you've been subject to a far greater trial than you've ever experienced when you were free to come and go as you please and go where you wanted to go and were subject to all kinds of, uh, all kinds of sin in this world and exposed to all kinds of things as you went about your daily business, none of, which, none of which bothered you, all of which washed over you. But now you find yourself cut off and shut in and isolated from others. And let me tell you, some folks will not make it through. Some people are going to be casualties in this battle for the heart. You see, there are real dangers for us when we're in a place of isolation. And one of those dangers is learning to lean entirely on online ministry. You see, this is not the norm for the church. This is not where we ought to be. You see, we can miss so much church that we end up not missing church at all. And that's a real possibility. And the devil would surely like that. But you must resist it. Listen, when these doors are opened on December 6th, I trust and pray that you will get up and come along and join with God's people again and get back into the saddle and get back into the fight. And don't let the devil wear you down in a war of attrition. The danger is that in a time like this, you can end up feeling abandoned or forsaken or uncared for. 
You can end up feeling that you will do just fine on your own. Thank you very much. Oh, the devil would like that too. God knows the human heart. And so to prove the sterling quality of his son, of the Lord Jesus, to prove that he was made of steel in the inner man, he brings him to this lonely place, a place of self-isolation, a desert place, a dry place, that he might test the inner character of Christ. But notice the duration of this temptation in verses 2 and 3. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, notice, for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was fasting. 40, of course, is the number of testing in Scripture. It's a number that is often associated with trial. Moses was up Sinai for 40 days receiving the tablets of stone from the hand of the Lord. The spies were sent into the land of Canaan for 40 days before they could bring back their report. Nineveh was given 40 days to contemplate the message of Jonah before judgment should be fallen. Elijah spent 40 days without food and without water. And we see the same thing in the life of the Lord Jesus. You know, on a human level, 40 days of fasting places him in a place of physical weakness. But here again, we see the devil's method of operation. You see, he comes to us when we are at our weakest, when we're down in the dumps, when we're physically ill, when we've been offended, when there's been some setback in our lives. Then he comes. And the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now the lion, of course, is the king of the beasts. It's a ferocious and fierce animal. But it's also a very strategic animal in its choice of prey. You see, a lion that would be approaching any herd of animals, whether that be wildebeest or zebra or, or, or whatever else, a, a lion approaching those animals will always seek out either the youngest or one that is wounded or one that is weak and ill. Isn't that how the devil works? And we see that here even in the life of Jesus. When Jesus was hungry, when he hadn't eaten anything, when he hadn't drunk anything for over a month, then Satan made his approach. Then he appears to tempt him. And this is how he operates. He comes maybe after a prolonged period of marital difficulty, squabbles in the home, differences of opinion, uh, sharp words being spoken, and he just whispers in the ear of one or the other, why don't you just leave? Why don't you just go? Why don't you, you know, life would be easier for you if you just packed your bags and walked out the door and started a new life without him or without her. He comes after a period of money problems, financial problems, and he says, listen, end it all. Kill yourself. Throw yourself off the bridge. Overdose on those drugs. Slash your wrists. Whatever it is he'll tell you to do, he'll encourage you in it. You see, he, he wants people to do that. He wants people to die and to go to hell. He, he wants people to leave behind, if they're Christians, tattered testimonies. And so he'll encourage people to end their lives. You know, there's no question about it. Although the government is not releasing the figures, there is no doubt that there has been an exponential rise in suicide during this last year that people in places of isolation feeling all alone in this world have sadly felt the need to take their own lives. And the devil would have you do that, you know. He comes after weeks of grief and bereavement. And he says to you, listen, that, you know, God doesn't care about you. God's not interested in you. If he, were caring, if he were caring, if he were loving, if he were a truly a God that was good, he would never have allowed, he would never have suffered your, your loved one to die. He comes after a period of long illness. Maybe when you have 
have, have just expended all your energy at the hospitals and the doctors and you've, you know, you've got a bag full of pills. And, and he says, listen, God, God obviously isn't hearing your prayers. Your prayers simply don't work. You see, friends, the servant, the Bible tells us, is not greater than his master. And what we witness in the life of Jesus is the experience of all those who follow Jesus. It was after a, an extended period of starvation that the devil came and tempted the Savior. Now notice the temptation in it. Remember, when this temptation came, it followed the Lord's baptism. It came hot on the heels of the heavenly testimony, this is my beloved Son. Now it's that very testimony that is about to be tested. Satan always wants us to doubt the word of God. We see that right from the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, he meets with Eve, and the first words he speaks is, Yea, hath God said. He casts doubt there upon the word of God. Now he's trying exactly the same tactic with the Lord Jesus Christ. And look how Matthew details this for us in the nature of the temptation he sets it before us. Notice verse 3. If thou be a son of God. Heaven's testimony was, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The devil says, if thou be the son of God. Verse 6, the same thing. If thou be the Son of God. Do you see that? The Father says one thing and Satan says another. The Father says, this is my beloved Son. And Satan says, if thou be the Son. He's always casting doubt upon the testimony of God's Word. You see, temptation is never just about you. It's never just a trial of your character, of your mettle, of your determination, of your commitment. Temptation is also a challenge to the testimony and to the promises of God. And that's the thing you need to get a hold of. When we are tempted, it's not your testimony alone that is on the line, but the very testimony of God himself. Now he comes to Jesus with three primary temptations. And we know them well. Verse 3, we see he approaches him concerning the lust of the flesh. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You know, I'm sure that the Lord Jesus would have liked nothing better than to have had a little piece of bread after some 40 days of fasting. Indeed, in the eating of bread, there is no sin whatsoever. But what Satan is really suggesting to him is that he break his fast uh, and, he, and he places his bodily needs, his physically, physical needs, ahead of the needs of his soul. He's really calling upon him to satisfy a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. Doesn't Satan still play that card? Doesn't he still come before us with desires that are legitimate desires? A desire for rest, a desire for intimacy, you know, a desire for love, uh, a desire uh, to meet our, our, our needs, to, to pay our bills. And then he suggests illegitimate means whereby those desires might be somehow satisfied. That's the lust of the flesh. But the Lord Jesus answers him and says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is written. The Lord always takes him back to the word of God. Friends, listen to me. You abandon the word of God at your peril. You put your Bible down at your peril. You close your Bible at your peril. You miss your devotions at your peril. You skip a church meeting and miss the preaching of God's word at your peril. The Bible is the there as part and parcel of your spiritual armor. It is the sword of the Spirit. And in that respect, it is used both for offense and also for defense. And so we need to get a, an understanding of the Word of God, and we need to invest ourselves and invest our time in the Scriptures so as to have an adequate defense against temptation. Then the devil comes in verse 6, and he brings a temptation in the realm of the pride of life. Look in verse 6. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, 
and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now here he is quoting from the book of Psalms, from Psalm 91 to be precise. But actually he's misquoting Psalm 91. You know, he's leaving part of that psalm out, and deliberately so. And how the devil likes for us to justify our behaviors and our sins by referencing the Word of God often out of context. It's often a reference that is wrenched away from the context, added to or taken away from in some part, so as to make the Bible say something that it was never in intended to say. It's very interesting that during the, uh, the early part of the pandemic, many Christian people were citing this same psalm, Psalm 91, and they were claiming the seventh verse in this psalm as immunity from COVID-19. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near to thee, it shall not come nigh thee. And they were saying, look, we're not going to fear because God has promised us that this disease is not going to touch us, that it's not going to hurt us. Look, that's a text taken out of its context. That verse had to do with the wilderness wanderers. It has nothing to do with COVID-19. And so, sadly, some of those people who claimed that verse and that passage in that way and, and took an historical reference and made it a promise of God for today, sadly, many of them did contract this disease, and some of them died. So the unsaved world, those events reflect badly upon the Word of God. Who do you think orchestrated that? Now, back in Matthew chapter 4, Satan says, in effect, to Jesus, Jesus, show us what you can do. You're the Son of God, after all, and there are some privileges that must come with that position. Why don't you show off the, 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 uh, the privilege of your status? Why don't you show us who you really are? Why don't you put Psalm 91 to the test? Why don't you throw yourself down here uh, and uh, you know cast yourself off this pinnacle of the temple, this high point, probably the southeastern corner of the temple mount? He says, why don't you just throw yourself down onto the street below, under the rocks below, and we know the Bible says that the angels will come and they will bear you up, that your head won't touch the ground before they catch you. How subtle this temptation is, because friends, real trust never tries the one it's trusting. If you trust someone, you don't try them. You don't test them. You know, I trust my wife. Absolutely, I trust my wife. But the day that I lift the phone and hire a private detective, it shows that I no longer trust my wife, that I'm putting her to some test, that I'm trying her in some way. And here Satan called upon Jesus to indulge in the sensational as proof of his sonship, uh, to perform some kind of circus trick. But Jesus is always one step ahead of the tempter. And so again, he re repeats his, his confidence in the Word of God. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And finally, in verses 8 to 9, we see the lust of the eyes. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him in a moment all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You will think about this. Satan takes the Lord up to this high place. He gives him a panoramic view of all the kingdoms of this world. You know, the greatest power on earth at that time was Rome. I imagine that he showed him something of Rome in that picture. That Rome was laid out before him. All the great buildings and all the senate and all the power and all the pomp and all the glory and the military might and the wealth of Rome and of other kingdoms around the world at that time. And he said, take a look, Jesus. All this could be yours. It could be yours today if you would just simply bow down and worship me. But the Lord knew that who you worship is who you serve. And he would not 
be made a sovereign by worshipping Satan. Rather, he would be made a slave by worshipping Satan. Look with me in Psalms chapter 2 for a moment. Keep your place in Matthew, but look in Psalms chapter 2 for a moment. And I want you to notice something with respect to the kingdom of Christ and to the kingdom that is an offer to him. In Psalms chapter 2 and verse 7, we have the very quotation that falls from the heavens at the baptism of our Savior. It says in verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Jehovah hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Notice there in verse 8 that Jesus is required to ask of his Father for the kingdoms of this world. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Ask of me, says his father. And yet Satan comes along, and, and it says something of his knowledge of the scriptures, that he says exactly the same thing, ever the counterfeit, ever the mimicker of the heavenly. And he says, ask me. Ask of me, and I'll give you the kingdom. Take it from me, and I'll give you these things. All these things will I give thee if you will fall down and worship me. It's as though he shows him a brochure of the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all this could be yours here and now if you would just accept me and would just ask. You know, this is the old lust of the eyes. It's the buy now, pay later philosophy. Satan says you can have the kingdom. You can have it today without a cross. You can have it without the suffering. Look, it's yours. All you have to do is worship me. But to do so would have placed the Savior in Satan's debt. And so he replies, Get thee hence, Satan. Again, coming back to the word of God, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thy serve. Then notice finally in verse 11, the ministration that followed his temptation. The ministration that followed it. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The victory won, we read, the devil leaveth him. I don't believe for one moment that this is the last encounter that the Lord ever had with the devil. You see, if there's one thing we know about the devil, it's this, the devil never quits. He never puts up the white flag of surrender. He has been fighting the will of God for some 6,000 years or so now, and he's still fighting the word and the will of God. And he will go on fighting till the very end. The very, the very kingdom of Christ itself shall be contested by Satan after 1,000 years of his reign upon earth. And remember in his life how toward the end of the Last Supper we read this, and the supper being ended, the devil having now put in, into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. He was going to face his greatest trial. His greatest confrontation was with the cross, so much so that he would pray, ultimately, Father, if it be thy will, take this thing from me. And think of the words of the Lord Jesus himself in John 14 and 30, just before he went to the cross, when he told those disciples gathered there in the upper room, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world, that is Satan, cometh and hath nothing in me. You know, I wish I could say the same thing of the devil, that, that I could say to him that uh, he would find nothing in me, but that's not the case. That's not, my, uh, con uh, that's not my constitution. It's not your constitution. That's not your disposition or my disposition. Your old nature, my old nature is bent toward sin. There's always something within us that will rise to temptation. But Jesus could not sin. It was not that he was able not to sin, but that he was not able to sin. He was impeccable. He was perfect in every way. But my point is this, 
Though we read, then the devil leaveth him. That was but a temporary departure, for the devil never gives up. And the devil's not going to give up on you either. If you face some temptation tonight or tomorrow or the day after, you be sure that if you have victory over it, that that's not the end of the matter, for the old devil will come back again and again and again until he can succeed in making you fall. And then we read, Behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Perhaps like Elijah of old, they brought him some food and some drink. Or indeed, perhaps they came to afford him some measure of the praise and worship that is his as Son of God, as the second person of the Godhead. How precisely they ministered unto him, we cannot say with any degree of confidence. But what we can say is that these same angels are often sent to minister unto us. Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits? Sent forth to minister unto them who are the heirs uh, of salvation. And the same book, Hebrews 13.2, reminds us that from time to time, Christians entertain angels unawares. You know, when we think about our temptations, we more often than not think of our failures rather than our victories. Like our first father, Adam, we are tempted and we fall sometimes too easily. But Jesus never fell, and Jesus never fails. I want you to get that. And that's what makes him such a wonderful Savior. You see, his victory is our victory. His cross becomes our cross. His resurrection becomes our resurrection. And in him, we too are victorious. In the words of Paul, we become more than conquerors. And yet often we feel anything but conquerors. We feel more often like failures than conquerors. But here, my friends, is the secret to success in the Christian life. My life and your life, if you're a believer, is hid with Christ in God. You and me, with all of our feelings, with all of our flaws, with all of our weaknesses, that we can live victoriously when we reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, when we identify with him in his death and in his resurrection, when we deny ourselves, he lives through us when there's an acknowledgement of our weakness, when we put our lives to the cross, being assured of his sonship, never doubting our standing in Christ, walking according to his word, how blessed we are then that we have a high priest in the heavens who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. What glorious hope he brings to us. What gracious empathy he offers us. And what a marvelous victory he extends to us. He affords to all those who trust him and walk in the spirit and not in the flesh a life of victory in Jesus. And that victory can be yours tonight if you will but surrender your life to his cross and identify with him completely. Maybe you're listening in tonight and you're not a Christian. Maybe you look at other Christian people and you think to yourself, well, you know, I could never live like they live. I could never go without. I could never abstain from the things they abstain from. I could never go do without the places I go to. I could never break from the friends that I have. I could never live as those people live. Well, friend, you'd be absolutely right if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. You see, in salvation, we find not just the gift of God, but the power of God. And by the gift of Christ and his salvation, we are enabled by him to live for him and for his glory. You see, salvation is entirely of God.
and the Christian life is entirely of grace. And tonight I want to implore you to abandon yourself to Christ, to confess your sins to him, to acknowledge that you are in need of him as your savior, to call on him, to cry out on his name. And the Bible says, if you'll do that tonight, you can be and will be saved. I wonder would you do that even this very Lord's Day evening. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening in tonight. And we trust the Lord will bless you in the week ahead. And we look forward by his grace to meeting again online on Wednesday evening. Shall we pray as we close? Father, we thank you tonight for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his impeccability. We thank you, Lord, that sin could not touch him. We thank you, Lord, that though Satan threw every arrow in his arsenal at him, though he sought to bring him down at every quarter through the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and the lust of the flesh, the Lord Jesus withstood it all and came out smelling of roses. He came out, Lord, as pure and as clean as he, was, as he came being born into this world. And Father, we just pray tonight that you'd help us to put our trust in his perfect life, in his perfect death, in his glorious resurrection. Help us who are saved to identify with him, to see that our victory is not in our flesh, but in him, and to indeed walk by faith and not by sight, and to live under the, uh, under the power uh, of uh, not just saving grace, but sanctifying grace, that we may live lives that are victorious and are a great testimony to him. Bless those who are unsaved that may watch this video. We pray, God, that you'd speak to their hearts tonight and you'd help them to see that there is a Savior from sin who has done everything for them that they might indeed be enabled to live for him and to live with him in heaven should they surrender their heart and life to him as Savior. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening this evening.